I'm a preacher of the Bible, and I believe in preaching the Word, right? So if you brought your Bible, how many of you brought your Bible? You may have a tree book, or you may have an e-book. That's okay. Uh, whatever it is, just open it up. There's an app you can find, and, and uh, you can look. You can find the notes online, all kinds of different things. But uh, open it up, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 23. We've been in a series of messages that we've been looking at the heroes of the faith, right, who overcame the world. And what we really learned, I hope, is that they weren't really such great heroes as they were simple people who just believed the Lord. They trusted God. They took a step of faith. They were ordinary people, just like you and me, but they sought an extraordinary God. How many of you know our God's extraordinary, right? Amen. And so they did great things. And what they did, we can do. If you live by faith, you also can become a faith hero as well. And so we're going to look this morning at the choices that faith makes. Now I want you to understand today that all of us are in reality a sum of all the different choices that we have made in life. And uh, when we make a choice in life, often one choice can have very significant consequences. A good choice can bring great benefits into your life. Uh, a negative choice can bring very uh, costly benefits into your life. But how many of you remember at least one good choice that you made? Wave at me. How many of you can remember a negative choice that you made? I, I've made a few of those myself, right? But, but every bad choice brings consequences as well. Let me just give you a couple of, just to kind of get your attention here today, a couple of interesting little stories. In 1920, the management of the Boston Red Sox made the bad choice to sell Babe Ruth's contract to the New York Yankees. And after joining the Yankees in 10 out of the next 12 seasons, Babe Ruth hit more home runs than all of the Red Sox team combined. <laughs> Amazing. How about this one in 1955? Sam Phillips sold to RCA Victor Records his exclusive contract with the young singer by the name of Elvis Presley, thus forfeiting royalties on more than a billion records. How many of you know that was a big mistake, right? Right? Those are some bad choices, but I'll have you know that in the realm of spiritual things, right, that you know, a bad choice can lead to extremely devastating consequences. Rejecting Christ can cause a person to spend an eternity in a place they didn't even want to know existed. Choosing to continue practicing sinful things can actually cause a person to lose their children or their home or their family or their job and all kinds of things. And of course, as always, the choice is ours, all right? So we're going to look at Moses today. How many remember Moses? Moses, right? Everybody's heard of him, and uh, and and uh, I'm going to give you a little brief synopsis of his life today, in case you just kind of to refresh your memory. He was born to parents who were uh, who were part of the children of Israel when they were slaves down in Egypt, and uh, when he was born, his parents hid him in a reed basket in the Nile River. Uh, of course, he was rescued by Pharaoh's daughter and uh, raised up as a prince within, with all of the wealth and the education of Egypt. And yet, he left all of that to align himself with these people, the Israelites, who were actually slaves down in Egypt. And of course, God used him in a great way. He was able to lead his people out of Israel. He's the guy who wrote the Ten Commandments. God gave him the Ten Commandments. He wrote the first five books of the Bible. God even says in the Word that he was his, God's friend. And so he's a, an amazing guy. And the amazing thing is that he also shows up in in this Hebrews chapter 11 that we're calling Heaven's Hall of Fame, all right? And it's interesting that what the Bible commends Moses' faith for was the decisions that he makes. How many of you know that when we make a decision, we've got to make a decision according to faith? And so we're going to look at some powerful decisions that Moses made that you and I also have to make as believers. Do I have any believers in the house? Wave at me. You trust in Jesus. Amen. All right, so the first decision that we've got to make that Moses made is that, or that rather that Moses' parents made, is that we've got to make the decision to obey God. God rather than men. 
We obey God rather than men. Now, there's a lot of people in our world today who view Christianity as something that's kind of essentially for weak, wimpy kind of people. You know, people with not a whole lot of backbone, people who never take a risk, that kind of hide in their house, kind of afraid of the world, and, uh, you know, they're happy with kind of a dull, boring type of lifestyle. How have you know that is so far from the truth? It's incredible. The Bible says that the righteous, that's you and me if you're a believer, that you and I ought to be as bold as a lion. Amen. It is the Christian who stands up against injustice, who stands up when everything else is wrong, everybody else is quiet. Generally, it's the Christian that stands up and says, we've got to do the right thing. Come on. I'm just here to tell you that Christianity is not for the weak. It's for the strong. A believer will stand up in spite of danger and, and, and criticism or threats. And how many of you know that it takes a lot of internal courage to go the opposite direction that the world is going? in, right? To live a life that's completely different. Amen. And so let me just read to you about Moses here. And the story of Moses here in Hebrews 11 begins with the faith of his parents. And uh, we know from Exodus 6, the name of his parents that were Amram and Jochebed, all right? So Hebrews 11 and verse 23 says this. It says, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. Now, as you read this, you've kind of got to use your imagination, all right? Many years had passed since Joseph had brought the children of Israel to Egypt, about 360 years at this point in time, and the current king of uh, or Pharaoh had forgotten all that Joseph and his family had done for Egypt, and, and now they were this entire group of people had become slaves. Aram and Amram and Jochebed were slaves. They had probably been beaten. How many of you think so? They were slaves. They knew what a whip was. They had been pushed around, abused. They were under constant surveillance by Pharaoh and his men, and they probably knew what a whip felt like upon their back. I feel sorry for them today. And the king had given this order that had to be obeyed. The first thing he did was he told the midwives, he said, listen, when these Egyptian, when these Israelite ladies have a baby, you're supposed to kill all of the male children. Well, the you know, the midwives, they feared God too much for that. And so that wasn't working out. And so the king gave another order. We read it here in Exodus 1, It says this, he told everybody, every son who was born you shall be cast into the river. How many of you know that's the Nile River, right? And every daughter you will save alive. And so you can imagine the heartache that this must have been for the children of Israel, taking every male child that was born and putting him in the Nile River to drown. How horrible would that have been? But you see, Jochebed and Amram decided to do something different. They took baby Moses. They saw that he was a beautiful child, okay. Uh, every parent looks at their child and says their child is beautiful, right? I'm sure they thought that. And so they, they took this, they, what they did was they made a little, a little boat out of bulrushes, and they put it in the, in the, in, in the reeds, in the, you know, by the lily pads close to the shore there. And uh, I'm sure that that caused them a lot of stress. Do I have any moms here that would like to leave your two-month-old baby in a little Nile River somewhere along with the snakes and every other thing that was out there? Can you imagine the stress that caused? And I'm sure that, that, that it was dangerous to actually go down there and feed the baby and take care of the child's needs. And it, it, but, but you know, they were not afraid of the king's command, the Bible says. Now, don't misunderstand that. I think they understood that, hey, there could be consequences that if they got caught. But you see, they were determined that they were going to believe that their God was bigger than, than the king and that they were going to trust their God with that. And so they disobeyed the king in defiance of his order. All right? And so you know the story a little bit later. Uh, what happened was the Pharaoh's daughter came and she saw this beautiful little baby and she took him into her own, into her own uh, uh, palace to be raised by him. 
And so uh, here's the thing today. As a believer in Jesus, do I have any believers here? All right, as a believer in Jesus, you and I live underneath a higher kingdom and a higher law than others in this world. There are moments in our life when we have to obey God and disobey the law of the land. Did you know that? In Romans chapter 13, it tells us this. It says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So what that tells us is that in most cases, we're supposed to listen to the law of the land. But my question is this. What happens when you're a believer and the law of the land goes against what you're supposed to do according to the Bible? Who are you going to obey? How many of you say, I'm going to obey God's law rather than man's law? Do I have any in the house that are going to believe the Lord? And so we have to obey God. And if you go back in the New Testament, you might recall that there was a moment when they told the apostles, they told them this, they said, listen, I don't want you preaching or teaching or doing any more miracles in the name of Jesus. You're just trying to cause us trouble. You guys just go sit down and be quiet. You're not to share about Jesus Christ. You're supposed to just be quiet. And, and, and But they did not do that. They continued to preach. And we when they were confronted, Acts 5 and verse 29 tells them this, it tells us this, that the apostles answered and they said, we ought to obey God rather than men. That's what Jochebed and Amron did. They obeyed God rather than the king's order. And you might be thinking, well, what does this have to do with me? It doesn't have much to do with me. I'm telling you, it might not now, but I can assure you if our culture and our society continues to go in the way that it's going, one day it will affect you and me. Because it's already today, uh, and there are many strict policies in some companies about sharing your faith. You can't even say Merry Christmas in some companies for fear you might offend somebody. You have to say Happy Holidays, all right? Uh, you know, there are, there, you know I've, I, I see, I've seen on, on, on the news where people have actually been fired for wearing a cross necklace, saying things about, uh, so, uh, about Christ on social media, hanging up something in their cubicle about Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come on. I am proud to say that I'm a follower and that I'm a believer in King Jesus, right? And, and, and I'll tell you, when I was a security officer out there in the world, and even in my life as a pastor, I do my best to share Christ wherever I, I have an opportunity. But, but, but I, and, and I'm not going to be limited by man's rules. And it's not just you, but it's me as well. How many of you realize that there's an agenda in our world today? That, 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 there's, that, that they are trying to tell pastors what they can preach and what they cannot preach. There's coming a day in our world when our government will say, hey, if you start preaching about certain things that are found in the Bible that are sinful, it's going to be considered as hate speech. Well, let me tell you something. I, for one, am going to preach the word Word of God and all of it, hello, because I answer to a higher authority. Come on, somebody. We've got to obey God rather than men. This morning in Korea and in, in North Korea and in China, there are people that are gathering in little groups in their home to study the Bible and to pray. You know, that's illegal in those countries. They're not supposed to be doing it, but guess what? They do it anyway. Why? Because they're going to obey God rather than men. Come on. I just am grateful for people who are willing to take a step of faith and believe the Lord. Consider down through history those who defied the laws of men to obey the laws of God. There were many devout Christians back during the days of the Civil War and before. Many devout believers who help those wonderful people who were trying to escape the South and slavery on what was, uh, what was known as the Underground Railroad, right? There were many believers who risked their life, risked their property to help somebody else. I'm going to tell you, that took a lot of courage. Come on. There were believers in Christ in World War II who hid Jewish people in their attic or out in their barn or, or dug a special place in the ground and fed them even though it was against the law. Why? 
because they knew they had to obey God rather than men. Come on, I'm just here today to tell you that God is looking for people in our world who have the courage to say, I'll do what is right and I'll obey the Lord. Come on. 